see what happened in June. So thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so my name's Colleen Moore. I work at the General Board of Church and Society, which is the social justice agency of the United Methodist Church. So I do all of the congressional and executive branch advocacy on peace building and disarmament issues. So I, I've been working on the issue of Palestine for 10 years. Um, I got my start actually interning at Code Pink back in the day when we were doing a lot of disruptive activities, much like today that they're still doing. And then I was a student organizer for Peace Action New York State, which is how I got connected to the amazing folks here at Peace Action New York State. I was in uh, the Finger Lakes in upstate New York with Peace Action Hobart William Smith Colleges and haven't left the family since. Um, <laughs> so yeah, now I then joined the board uh, a little over a year ago. So yeah, when I right after I started in this role, I, um, I had this opportunity. I started in the role in November, um, only about a month after the October 7th attacks. And um, then I got this opportunity to travel to the region. And I mean, I've been working on the issue for so long and I knew that I really needed to go to really ground my advocacy. Um, so I traveled with a Presbyterian Church USA delegation. They have what's called the Israel-Palestine Mission Network, IPMN, um, that does a lot of really amazing work on Israel and Palestine. And there were like three of us from the United Methodist Church that were able to go as well. Um, so we traveled to the West Bank and Jerusalem. And so I, I put together this presentation. I've been doing a very similar presentation to a lot of groups within the church and outside. Um, so really focus on the displacement that we saw throughout Jerusalem and the West Bank and settler colonialism. And then I'll kind of end with what does this all mean and what can we do? Um, and I hope when we get to question and answer and discussion, like I know all of you are very active advocates on this. And I hope we can have conversations and I don't wanna just like talk at people because everyone here is just just as knowledgeable as me, if not more. Um, but really, uh, I'm doing this to show some of these real life on the ground examples of what's going on. I mean, we're so focused on a ceasefire in Gaza, rightfully so, that is the most important thing we can be doing right now. But the situation in the West Bank and Jerusalem is extremely bad and there, there's so much suffering and we can't miss that in our advocacy. So yeah, it's kind of some themes that I've picked up that I'll, I'll go through in my presentation, really talking about this violent settler colonial and Zionist ideology that we saw as we were traveling throughout the Holy Land um, and its connection with white Christian nationalism and religious supremacy and how we're dealing with that in our own settler colonial context. Um, what is the future of coexistence and bridge building, nonviolent resistance, and I'll talk a little bit at the end of the importance of the boycott, divest, sanction movement, the BDS movement, and how we can be advocates more on pressuring Israel on uh, the displacement and violence that we're seeing in the West Bank and Jerusalem. So I, again, I know that you're all here because you know of what's going on, but I just wanted to give a little bit of historical context to ground us, especially where we were traveling and what we were doing. So again, as many of you probably know, um, so Israel, after the Six Day War in 1967, occupied Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. Um, in 2005, Israel technically withdrew from Gaza, but as we know, they have been under a blockade since 2007. Um, Israel and next East Jerusalem officially in 1980 um, and they still have not withdrawn from the West Bank as I'll be detailing in our travels. Um, the next slide I'll talk a little bit more about what areas A, B, and C mean because um, I'll be talking a lot about that in our travels and just wanted to mention as I'll be talking a lot about illegal Israeli Jewish only settlements. Under international law these settlements are considered illegal as a violation of the Geneva Convention which bans an occupying power from trans transferring its own population to the area occupies. So I'll be talking a lot about these areas. So area A um, is most of the Palestinian cities of Nablus, of Ramallah, Bethlehem, Hebron. Most of those city centers are under area A. So it's under Palestinian administrative and security control. Area B is under joint, so it's Israeli security and Palestinian administrative control. And then Area C, which is um, a huge chunk of the West Bank, is under Israeli control. So I just wanted to kind of ground us in that um, as I'll be talking a lot about that. So where we traveled, we flew in uh, to Jordan 
and crossed over into the West Bank and that border is controlled by the Israelis. Um, and we, we thankfully got through safely. We had to like delete all the social media apps off our phone. We had to delete messages off our phones just to make sure we could get through. Um, and there was actually a Palestinian She's a Palestinian-Armenian woman who was born in Jerusalem, but now lives in the United States, was traveling with us, and she always flies in through Tel Aviv, and she was telling us a story that she always says at um, customs when she's going into the country of Israel of, oh, where were you born? When were you born? And she's like, I'm older than the state of Israel. And then they detain her. So we're like, Lucy, we're just trying to get in. Maybe don't do that today. Um, so we all got in safely, thankfully. Um, so we crossed into the West Bank and spent a lot of time in Jerusalem and then we moved north into Ramallah and Nablus. Um, a lot of the farms I'll be talking about are right in between uh, Nablus and Ramallah and uh, then we went south to Bethlehem and then Hebron is where we ended our travels. So I'm gonna talk a lot about what's going on in East Jerusalem. Uh, so we had a really great uh, tour from a organization called Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. A lot of really amazing progressive Israelis who are resisting displacement and home demolitions in Jerusalem and the West Bank and throughout Israel. So they basically gave us like a tour of occupied East Jerusalem um, right here. Um, this is our amazing tour guide, Cheska. Uh, but here we're overlooking uh, Jerusalem you can kind of see it's not the greatest picture but you can kind of see the dichotomy here I mean over here on the left is the built up uh, West Jerusalem I mean it's like skyscrapers it's um, high-rise buildings and then you can see uh, more over here in East Jerusalem is not as built up. So you, you could even see from that first day of just the dichotomy between East and West Jerusalem. And as you're traveling through East Jerusalem, I mean, there's settlements everywhere. There'll be a Palestinian neighborhood, massive settlement, Palestinian neighborhood, massive settlement. Um, and there's no freedom of movement throughout Jerusalem. Um, there's a series of checkpoints, as I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our experiences in the West Bank with this. But even throughout Jerusalem, Jerusalem, one third of those who live in Jerusalem still have to pass through multiple checkpoints, not even leaving the city, just going throughout Jerusalem, um, living their daily life, going to work, visiting their family. Um, and one thing that I don't think I really realized about these um, Israeli Jewish only settlements, I think the narrative is really that, oh, there's these like hilltop, like Jewish communities. No, these are massive cities massive cities, like and, uh, mostly secular people that move there and might not necessarily have connections to their Jewish identity. A lot of them, of course, do. Um, but I mean, that's really as we're thinking about this like two state solution and what what is the future? I mean, it's these settlements dot East Jerusalem and the West Bank and they're massive. I mean, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and there's plans for more to be built in East Jerusalem since October 7th. Um, there's plans for five new ones. Um, and one that we went to is called Maleadumim, which is the fifth largest settlement in the West Bank. It's just outside Jerusalem. This has 100,000 settlers and it's still the, the fifth largest. And they plan to expand it. I mean, their plans for expansion, they wanna be Tel Aviv, essentially is what they're saying. This is right outside Jerusalem. Um, and also talking about the wall, you may have heard about this apartheid border. They, Israel calls it their security border. Um, one thing I didn't realize until I was there, it doesn't quite follow the internationally recognized borders between uh, East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Israel says it does. It says it's to, you know, for security purposes, but it's drawn in such a way that it intentionally grabs land that they want but excludes Palestinians from being in the city of Jerusalem. So there are Palestinian neighborhoods that technically live in Jerusalem, but they're outside the wall. So they have to drive probably miles to get to the checkpoint, which they could arbitrarily be turned away from. They might not get through. Um, so it really cuts off Palestinian neighborhoods from each other and it's so fragmented. Uh, and again, one thing I didn't know, even if they're outside the wall, but they're still technically in the municipality of Jerusalem, they still have to pay taxes. So even though they don't really have regular access to the actual city, they don't have access to those services, they still have to pay taxes, um, even though they're not within the wall. So you could really see the apartheid system at work here. 
Um, these two pictures, they're, they're not the best pictures. I took them from the bus. Um, but you can tell that this one on the left is a Palestinian neighborhood, and this one on the right is a Israeli settlement. Because on the left, if you see these uh, black tanks, they have to store potable water on their roofs because the state of Israel does not provide potable water for them. Um, and this is in strict contrast. You might be able to see it. This is a big water slide that's at the beginning of the settlement. I mean, everywhere we saw in these settlements, they have massive swimming pools, massive water slides, access to drinking water. And so it's, it's a water crisis. It's a climate crisis. I mean, they're sucking up all of the water. And even some Palestinians we talked to say that the potable water they're buying is running out. And some of them don't, they can't even buy water anymore. Um, and also driving throughout East Jerusalem, again, in strict contrast with West Jerusalem. I mean, you, in West Jerusalem, you see banks, you see post offices, you see schools, but driving throughout East Jerusalem, you don't really see post offices, you don't see banks, you don't, you don't see these services that people should have access to. Um, and within these settlements, they have everything they need. Like it's like a self-contained city, basically. They have schools, they have their own banks, uh, but Palestinians in the, in the Palestinian neighborhoods do not have access to basic services like that. And so we went to two neighborhoods in East Jerusalem where there's um, a really big threat of displacement, a lot of home demolitions going on, unfortunately. So one of them is Sheikh Jarrah. Um, many of you might know about this case from a few years ago. It, really went viral in the US and globally back in 2021 because they've been in this legal battle to stay on their land. Um, and basically the state of Israel is trying to take away their land um, for settlers to be on. Um, the courts continue to refuse to take up this case of ownership and settlers are just moving into the neighborhood. Uh, they tried giving checks, like blank checks to residents to leave, but they don't understand that it's their connection to this land. I mean, it's, it's the principle of you're not going to kick me off my land. I don't care how much money you give me. And also if they take the check, then the state of Israel can come back and be like, oh, well, you took this check. You, you don't have this land anymore. Um, so this house right here, um, again, you might not be able to see it, but there's a bunch of Israeli flags. I mean, this was right across the street from a house we met with a lot of the Palestinian families, the ones who are at the forefront of this campaign to save their neighborhood. They're right across the street from settlers who moved in and they still haven't left. And if anything, more settlers are moving in and they're becoming more and more violent. Um, and it's really because this neighborhood is strategic for Israel because it connects West and East Jerusalem. Uh, another case, uh, another neighborhood we went to called Silwan. Um, this is one of the cases that really broke my heart. I mean, we were, the meeting that we had with families in Silwan, uh, we, we had to have on this like playground. And so there were like all these families and kids playing around us while we're talking about the possibility of their homes being demolished. I mean, at, at any point, um, the state of Israel can roll in and take their house or settlers can come and take their house. So since October 7th, three homes have been demolished. And I think that's actually probably more by now. We heard that when we were there, a few more were slated to be demolished. Um, they're always increasing expansion plans. Um, and part of this is there's this deal for a cable car to go from the old city to West Jerusalem. And so the, that would go right through Silwan. Um, and I did wanna mention this, there's a lot of US so-called Christian organizations that are funding this. Um, there's one particular one, and I, I'd have to look back at my notes, I forget the name of it, but it's like far right, um, like Christian nationalist group that's unfortunately funding this. Um, and one thing that I did not know about this with home demolitions, not only is their home being demolished, but they are forced to pay for it. They are forced to pay for the bulldozers, for the police. And if there's any rubble left over, they get fined. And I mean, it just adds insult to injury. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and this picture, uh, it's a campaign called All Eyes on Silwan. Um, a lot of U.S. organizations are funding this really just to raise awareness of like, we have our eyes on you, you will not take our homes. Um, and so they have 
eyes painted of famous activists. So this one um, is George Floyd. And then around the same time as uh, Black Lives Matter protest in 2020, um, there was a, a case of an autistic man, unarmed uh, autistic Palestinian man who was shot and killed by the IDF going through a checkpoint. Um, his name was Ayad al-Halak. And so they put these kind of right next to each other as a symbol of the intersectionality and the, the partnership in the struggle. So I, I wanted to include that picture as well. Um, yeah, we saw all these murals. I mean, they're so proud of their neighborhood. I mean, just the resilience and like steadfastness of the Palestinian people. And we really saw this in Silwan. It's just so inspiring. And I, I just, it just breaks my heart. I mean, especially to see all of their kids playing around them and they're talking about their home that being demolished. And it's just, it's just absolutely horrific. Uh, so one other uh, neighborhood in East Jerusalem is the Armenian Quarter that's under threat of displacement. So this is one of the four sectors of the walled city of the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, so the Armenian presence in Jerusalem dates back to the fourth century when Armenia adopted Christianity as a national religion. And so they're also under threat of displacement as well. And I didn't know too much about this until I went there. So in 2021, there was a plot of land that was leased to a hotel developer developer and essentially the Armenian church kind of sold out the people that live in the Armenian quarter agreed to this hotel deal that would displace a lot of Armenians in the Armenian quarter so they were resisting in this in the courts for two years thankfully the deal was canceled but right after it was canceled one night a bunch of armed settlers come in and like physically attack the Armenians that are living in the Armenian quarter um, but the Armenians fought back I mean now they have a 24-hour encampment to stay on their land uh, this is a picture here this is actually a parking lot that's really key to holding the Armenian quarter um, that you know if the parking lot falls then the Armenian quarter falls um, so they have a 24-hour encampment in this parking lot to fight to stay on their land and it's a really great organization called Save the Ark um, Save the Armenian quarter um, because they still get attacked sometimes in the middle of the night and um, they will not they refuse to leave their land and they will fight so then talking a little bit more about the West Bank and what we saw there. So right after we were in Jerusalem, we went north to a city called Nablus. So uh, like I said at the beginning, Nablus is one of the Palestinian cities that is under area A. Um, so under Palestinian security and administrative control, we visited with a church called the Church of the Good Shepherd, which is an Episcopal church. And only about a week before we were there, they were unfortunately raided by the Israeli army. Um, they came in, they broke down the doors, they entered the sanctuary, they vandalized the parish hall, they vandalized the shops below. And what we have heard is that they leased one of the shops below them to Samsung. And there was some kind of deal that fell through between Samsung and Israel. So they think this was retaliation for them leasing this shop, um, which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the IDF didn't actually give any reason, no apology. And they apparently did it again only a few weeks ago. They, they raided the church again. Um, so this is, I, I point out why this is area A. I mean, this is under Palestinian administrative and security control and the IDF can still roll in and do what they want to do. Um, and again, just talking about just the resilience of the Palestinian people, they were attacked at 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning and one of the pastors came in, he cleaned up everything, he repaired the doors and only a few hours later, they still held service that Sunday morning. They, they refused to you know, be, they refused to go down. They, um, it, it's really amazing just to see this resilience. Um, and the U.S. is investigating this as a violation of religious freedom, supposedly. Um, I mean, we obviously need more than that. We need more than it just going into a report. We need actual pressure on Israel to stop this uh, IDF violence. Um, and this is the one of the pastors, Pastor Sammy, um, who came up, uh, came in in the middle of the night and cleaned up the church. Uh, but just wanted to point out their statement after they called the invasion an evil and cowardly act and quoted Matthew 16, 18 in response. And I say to you again, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then just in our conversation with them, he said, look at the IDF soldiers were to stand right in front of me. I would not have hatred. I would have love for them and open their hearts to God. Um, and so this is really the, the nonviolent resistance that we saw throughout the West Bank and Jerusalem. 
Uh, and another place we went to in Nablus called uh, Jacob's Well, which you may be familiar with in the New Testament. It's the scene of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. Um, so it's Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. So this is Father Eostinus. Uh, I think he's... 90 or so now. Um, he has been the guardian of Jacob's Well since 1980. Um, and his predecessor was actually murdered by an Israeli. Um, it was somebody who didn't believe that Jacob's Well should be open to all religions. He was a Jewish supremacist. Um, and then the, the guy was never arrested. He came back when Father Yosinos took over and also tried to fight him as well. So we fought him off. Um, and yeah, even during the second intifada, the Israeli army dropped five bombs and the, thankfully none of them detonated. But I mean, this is, this is one of the most sacred sites in Abrahamic religions and the IDF army was trying to bomb it. Um, yeah, Father Yosinos has gone through a lot. He was shot at by men from the Balata refugee camp a few years ago. And he basically rebuilt this church by himself after both the 1927 earthquake and then the 1979 attack where his predecessor was killed. Um, so it's really amazing to yeah, be at that sacred site and see the violence of the, of the IDF and sellers. Um, one other instance that happened, this was as we were leaving Nablus and just talking about that system of checkpoints. So we were a bus full of Americans. We could generally go wherever we wanted. I mean, they didn't care. They wouldn't really check on us. Occasionally they would board the bus. We would show them our US passports and you could go right through. But in Nablus, uh, as we were leaving Nablus, we had uh, four Palestinian journalists with us. Uh, and we were ultimately detained uh, because we had the Palestinians with us. Um, we were stopped for like 45 minutes. They checked only the IDs of the Palestinians. I mean, they, they saw the rest of us had US passports. They're like, yeah, you're fine. Uh, but they took all of the IDs of the, the four Palestinians. And about 45 minutes later, we were ultimately turned away. And even the IDF soldier, I mean, this kid looked like he was 16 years old. He's like, I, I don't know why this decision came down. It's out of my hands. It came from higher up. We have no idea why you've been turned away, but you cannot cross through the checkpoint here to get south to Ramallah. So we had to drive about an hour out of the way north doing the, the north uh, checkpoint in Nablus to get south to Ramallah. So that's supposed to be like a 30, maybe 40 minute drive from Nablus to Ramallah. And it took about three hours. And I mean, for us, it's like, you know, added a little bit to our journey and was a little bit strenuous, but I, I can't imagine having to do that on a regular basis. I mean, just traveling for work, for family, or just because they want to drive through their country, like not knowing if you're going to be able to get through, not knowing if it's going to take 30 minutes or three hours. I mean, it just really shows that there, there is no freedom of movement um, throughout the occupied territories. Uh, we went to some Bedouin farms in between Nablus and Ramallah as well. So we went to this village called Sinjal, which is under constant threat from armed settlers. Um, actually, just the night after we left, um, there were a bunch of fires set by armed settlers. I mean, they walk through the land openly armed. They threaten the farmers. They take their livestock. Um, they try to claim this land as their own. So we met with this uh, nonviolent resistance group called the Palestinian Farmers Collective that are really trying to protect all of these farms in this area near Sinjel. Uh, they took us to another Bedouin farm, and this family was forced to leave Jericho um, because of the state of Israel, and now they're also under threat from armed settlers. It's the same thing. I mean, you could see settlers walking through their land. I mean, it's, it's as ridiculous as some of the settlers will take selfies with the land and then use that in court cases. Be like, oh, look, I have a picture with the land. It's mine. And sometimes they take that as legitimate. Um, and this picture, um, we just stopped along uh, this uh, farm that had a cucumber patch along the highway. And unfortunately, the wall is going to plan to go through this farmland, so there's so much farmland that this is going to destroy, um, and these, these farmers are going to lose their land. 
Uh, Ten of Nations is um, another farm that's just south of Jerusalem or, or right outside of Bethlehem. Uh, so this is a farm that has been in uh, Dawood Nassar's family for decades. I mean, they have papers from the Ottoman Empire proving their ownership, uh, but they've been in a legal battle for over 30 years to keep their farm. Um, but you could see, even when we were there, you can see in this picture, um, there's like an RV parked right outside the land, right outside the fence. And sometimes they'll blast country music in the middle of the night to try to intimidate and just annoy the, the farmers. Um, and as we were leaving, actually, there was an Israeli military vehicle that pulled up right alongside it. And the main road into uh, Ten of Nations has been blocked for years. Uh, armed settlers will not allow you to pass or use violence to prevent you from passing. So you can't actually access the, the farm from the main road. You have to go all the way up and around and climb a hill to get there. And recently we know that settlers came in the middle of the night and sold their chickens, sold their livestock. And there was a volunteer, or a part of my delegation, she stayed and volunteered for an extra week. So she was updating us on that situation. Uh, so they have a lot of international volunteers that come every year to work the farm and serve as international protection. But unfortunately, since October 7th, that's really dwindled. They haven't had as many, but I think it is ramping back up. Uh, but this is one case, I think, especially here in the US, we can do a lot of advocacy around uh, because there's some upcoming dates for their court cases that the US can really put uh, pressure on Israel um, to make sure that the Nassar family can um, keep their land. And this is, we're at Ten of Nations kind of overlooking all of the, um, the valleys below. And you look around, I mean, this is the only hill in the area that's not occupied by a settlement. I mean, there's six settlements surrounding it. Um, so you know that they're really encroaching on the farm. It's really a microcosm of what's happening across the West Bank. I mean, this, this is just one case. Um, and this one case has gotten a lot of international attention, but there's so many other cases. And one of the reasons is because it's kind of the front line. I mean, if Ten of Nations falls. There's so many neighborhoods below that are already at risk of displacement, but could be even more so at risk. Um, the United Methodist Church has a partnership with a community uh, called Wadi Fokin that um, you can see somewhere down in this picture um, in the valley below Tent of Nations. And there's going to be an, a, a settler only road that will be built through Wadi Fokin. And there's a lot of hearings coming up about that. And so that's also another opportunity for advocacy for US advocates to support what's going on in Wadi Fokin against the settler only road that would destroy farmland and displace more people. And so one of the last days we were there, we made our way to Hebron, which is in the south of the West Bank. And this was, I was talking with someone earlier, like, you know, did you see, did you, did you seem like frightened? Did you feel frightened when you were there? Did you feel unsafe? And I, I really didn't for the majority of the time. I mean, in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, I felt very safe, like walking by myself or especially being in groups. But Hebron is one city that I went to and I'm like, it's time to go home. I, I'd like to go home now because it was just a really scary situation. Um, so again, kind of looking back to that areas A, B, and C, um, as I said, most Palestinian cities are in area A, but Hebron is very different. So theoretically it is, it's, it's Palestinian city center, but it's absolutely empty. I mean, there's only IDF soldiers and armed settlers that just roam the city center. Um, and the main street is called Shahada Street. And, you know, decades ago, I mean, this was like Palestinian shopkeepers, fruit and vegetable and meat markets. I mean, it was the thriving, this is the largest city in the West Bank. It was a thriving city center. Um, but now, I mean, it was, it was eerie how empty it was. There are no Palestinians in the city center. There are multiple checkpoints. There's IDF soldiers everywhere, even more so than other parts of the West Bank. And just openly armed settlers that are walking through the streets of Hebron. And this is really been since 1994. Um, there was a Israeli settler named uh, Bear Goldstein, who's actually from New York, um, who committed a massacre at the Ibrahimi Mosque. Um, massacred, I believe it was dozens of Palestinians who were worshiping at the mosque. And in response, Israel tightened restrictions on movements of Palestinians. Make that make sense. They, he massacred Palestinians and they cracked down on Palestinians' freedom of movement. And they closed the vegetable and meat markets. They banned any Palestinian cars on the main street, on Shahada Street. 
And my understanding is this has gotten even worse since October 7th as well. Even more shops have been closed and they've tightened restrictions even more so. And the reason why I say this is one of the scarier um, kind of cities we went to is, is we had kind of a confrontational encounter with an armed settler who was wandering through Hebron. So you can kind of see him over here in this green shirt on the right side. Um, I mean, we obviously were, we, we had a, a tour guide who is Palestinian, a Palestinian woman. And so if he's walking up, it's very obvious what perspective we're getting. And so he comes up and he's like, oh, you're only getting one side of the story. And as soon as he starts talking, I mean, you know, this isn't a guy that you reason with, you talk with, and you're going to try to change his mind and have dialogue. I mean, this is a guy who will be very violent if he disagrees with you. I mean, his whole life is based in this Zionist ideology that I have a right, I'm from Europe, I'm not even from here, but I have a right to this land to displace you. Um, and I mean, he was outwardly armed. We, we saw the gun on him. Um, and I think some members of our delegation were trying to have a little bit of dialogue with him and it really erupted. And luckily it was um, de-escalated, so nothing happened, but you can kind of see members of our, members of our delegation kind of trying to talk him down. But again, this is, this is not something where it's like bridge building, we're just trying to have dialogue. It's like, no, these people will use violence against you. So this is a really scary situation. I think Hebron was really, yeah, I think it was, it was the scariest thing that I saw. And I think I was talking to you about, yeah, going to Hebron of like, yeah, I don't wanna go there again. And that's kind of how I felt of, yeah, um, I think it, it's one of the worst cases that we're seeing in the West Bank right now. And so we ended our time, um, I think it was the day before we went to Hebron, but um, we participated in an interfaith march for human rights which was supposed to be kind of a counter protest to, uh, you may have seen this in the news, the Jerusalem Day Nationalist March. So every day it's known as Nakba Day um, for Palestinians, uh, but for Israel it was this big nationalist march. So a few days prior to it, we didn't actually go to the nationalist march, but we went to kind of this counter protest for human rights a few days prior. So um, yeah, I was partnering with like rabbis for human rights, Jewish groups, Muslim groups, Christian groups. Um, and it was really amazing to see that and dichotomy with what happened a few days later with the Jerusalem Day Nationalist March. Uh, you may have seen in the news that it got very violent. I mean, there were Israeli youth attacking Palestinian journalists. They were wandering through the old city, um, physically attacking Palestinian shopkeepers. And it really, like, especially seeing the narrative in the media of like, oh, these are just some fringe extremists that doesn't represent, you know, all of Israel. And while that might be true, it is so core, that ideology is so core to everything I talked about, to displacement and the home demolitions, settler violence. I mean, that Zionist ideology is so key to everything that's happening in Palestine. And I also, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it's so connected with this white Christian nationalism we're seeing globally and here in our own country with this religious supremacy everything we're seeing with Christian supremacy here in the United States, and also wrestling with our own settler colonial history here in the United States. And I truly believe that's maybe why we're not wrestling as much with Zionism as a settler colonial ideology is because that means we actually have to take a look at ourselves and what we have done here in the United States. So coming up on the end of my presentation, I won't talk for too much longer, I promise. <laughs> um, yeah, just some takeaways. I think really talking about this like two-state solution or versus one-state solution, where do we go for here, the, what's the solution, that's all we're seeming to hear about in the news, right, is we're working for a two-state solution. And I mean, after seeing all of this, I, you know, I've never necessarily thought um, of, you know, two-state solutions better than a one-state solution, but especially after being there, I mean, how can East Jerusalem be the capital of Palestine if we're talking about a two-state solution? There's not a capital there. There's no freedom of movement. It's so fragmented. It's so dominated by Israeli settlements. How can we talk about a two-state solution when the West Bank, as I've described, is so fragmented? Again, no freedom of movement. Um, and also, how can we talk about coexistence, which we should, abs I mean, we should absolutely talk about coexistence and it is absolutely the right way forward. But the goal of Israel's system is to cut off Palestinians from, or cut off Israelis from seeing Palestinians. I mean, as I was talking about in 
Jerusalem, I mean, with the wall that's being built, they're explicitly excluding Palestinians from being in the city of Jerusalem. I mean, you can go about your day as an Israeli settler in these like self-contained communities and never encounter Palestinians. I mean, how can we even talk about bridge building and coexistence when the system is explicitly shutting that down? So uh, we had a presentation from uh, someone named Jonathan Kutab. Uh, he uh, founded, or he's currently the executive director of Friends of Sabil North America. He founded Nonviolence International and El Haq, which is a Palestinian human rights organization. He said, like, all of you Americans need to stop prescribing solutions. Like, we're working on it. What you can do is help us work towards tenets of a solution. Like, stop saying, like, oh, you need two state, you need one state. You need to help us work towards nonviolence, toward disarmament on all sides, towards equality, dismantling apartheid. And human rights, we need to work towards adherence to international law, justice, accountability, freedom of movement. So, yeah, I think some of these examples that I've talked about, I think it's really, really key to talking through these conversations of like, what is the solution? How do we stop prescribing these solutions and actually assist Palestinians in their work towards human rights and equality? And also, I mean, as I was talking about of what happened in Hebron, I think, especially talking to our own Christian, uh, uh, our fellow Christians and talking within the churches, I mean, I think we really need to unpack this, uh, you know, white Christian nationalism and how it's uh, so tied to Zionism and Christian Zionism. Um, so you may know that Zionism is the belief that the Jewish people have a right to a national home in the Holy Land and the land of Palestine. And it's so connected with the settler colonial intentional far right ideology. And especially Christian Zionism, I mean, it, it's really about this like end times theology. And it's, I mean, if you haven't uh, read too much about this, it's pretty wild what they believe of, um, you know, what's happening in Palestine right now is like fulfilling the prophecy. And uh, when Israel is confronted by its enemies, that will uh, bring the, um, uh, the end times and the resurrection of, or the, um, uh, the, yeah, the rapture, that's what it's called. Um, and it's really, it's cherry picking from the Bible. It's taking very specific sentences. It's not actually talking about the whole of the Bible and it's ignoring the plight of Palestinian Christians. I mean, all of these examples I was talking about, they're displacing Palestinian Christians. And how can Christians here in the US ignore that plight of the Palestinians, the indigenous Palestinian Christians? I mean, it runs counter to biblical teachings, like that is not the Christianity I practice of any kind of supremacy that displaces another group of people. And so many sites, as I was talking about, like Jacob's Well is cut off to uh, those Christians and Muslims that it's very sacred to their religion. And as I've said multiple times, it's, you know, it's really connected to what we're seeing here in the US and globally with white Christian nationalism. And I think we just, we need to unpack that as Christian communities, but also um, within our secular communities as well. So what you can do, um, just a few slides on, uh, yeah, like you have all of this information. What do we do now? I mean, I know it, it's so overwhelming. There's so much information. It's such a depressing situation. It doesn't seem to be changing. Um, but I think, you know, having conversations with people is so important of, in your communities, with your families, in your congregations, and sharing some of these resources. Um, and I do find that returning from my trip. I've had a lot of tough conversations with my family, with different congregations, and I think explicitly talking about some of these real life examples, like, okay, I won't dive into settler colonialism and Zionism right off the bat with somebody who might not know too much about that or is more um, pro-occupation, but I think using these real life examples, I, I use the example that I was talking about of the neighborhood of Silwan a lot. I'm like, imagine if this was your family that was at risk of having your home demolished. Think of your daughter, think of your son, think of your family. What would you do? Like you would do anything to protect them and just, um, just put yourself in the situation. I think that has, like that, that does have the potential to get through to people more of like imagining what it would be like if it was them and using some of these on the ground examples. Um, and of course, like unpacking everything I just talked about of Christian Zionism and engaging in this interfaith dialogue is so important. Um, this is actually a picture of me with 
bunch of kids at a refugee camp in Bethlehem. Um, and these kids were so cute and they were just coming up to us and asking for Israeli shekels. And um, I mean, it was just really moving to always see the, the kids around. And they're so, I mean, they're kids. They're like, they're looking for joy and they're looking for hope. And it, it's so hard to imagine that hope sometimes, but it was really seeing the kids that would kind of bring it home for me. Um, so what we can do on advocacy, I mean, we need to continue this advocacy for a ceasefire in Gaza. As I've said, this is the most important thing we can do, but we also can't forget the West Bank and Jerusalem. Um, everyone we talk to, like we would specifically ask, like, what do you want us to do? And so the Biden administration has imposed some sanctions on settlers, but it's been very piecemeal. I think it's at best like a dozen settlers that they have sanctioned. And the settlers have come out and said, this hasn't really affected us too much. It's at worst like an inconvenience because the state of Israel is not enforcing these. And so it's, it's a nuisance for them and it's not actually harming them in any way. So we need, we need an expansion and strengthening of these sanctions on the settlers, but we also need to sanction Israeli officials. And that's of course what the Biden administration is not doing. So we need more US public pressure on Israel regarding all of these cases that I mentioned of 10 of nations of Wadi Fokin. And I mean, we're having active State Department meetings and trying to get them to do more. And yeah, they say they're investigating certain religious freedom violations, but we of course need more. And I think the biggest thing I took away from the trip was the importance of BDS, of boycott, divest, sanction movement. I mean, I think that's really where we need to hit them the most is financially. Like we need to make it financially not viable anymore to do what they're doing. Um, so participating in these nonviolent economic measures that aid in ending the occupation, which has proven to be such an effective uh, tool. I mean, we saw that in South Africa. Um, so you can, you know, if you're working for like I'm working for a church, so we're working on divesting from Israeli companies operating in the occupied Palestinian territories or boycotting certain Israeli goods that are emanating from illegal settlements. And I know a lot of different organizations have lists of organizations and products uh, like AFSC, American Friends Service Committee has a good list. Um, and also when we were there, I mean, just saw the importance of supporting uh, Palestinian businesses and products. I mean, when we were in Bethlehem, um, these shopkeepers are so desperate. They're so in need. I mean, these are shopkeepers who make their living on tourism. And when we were there in June, there was one shopkeeper I was talking to. I think I bought like 15 kafias from him because I felt so bad. It's like, just take all my money. Um, but he said that we were like the 10th tourist that he had since October 7th. And this is people who make their living off of tourism. They are not, I mean, these beautiful handmade kabiyas and goods are just sitting and like sitting in an empty shop um, and not being bought. So I think we also really need to invest in the Palestinian economies um, and of course support organizations like Peace Action Fund of New York State, which is why we're here today. They're doing such amazing work on the ground here in the United States, um, organizing for a ceasefire and for a just peace in Israel and Palestine. Um, so I, I have just a sheet here. You can scan the QR code or I can send you the link, but you can scan that if you have your phone. I can keep this up of just some of the resources. I mentioned some of the organizations we met with, um, just a few news articles that explain some more of the examples that I talked about. So um, yeah, I can keep that up if you wanna scan that. So yeah, that's all for me. Um, I would love to have discussion and questions, but again, I know that all of you here are so knowledgeable about this and are hardcore activists on this, so I'd love to have a discussion and I don't need to keep talking at you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know, I, th I think just life is so precious. I mean, it really, really makes you think of your own mortality almost. Um, and just that these are normal people trying to live their normal lives and they are prevented from doing so. And I mean, it, it was just such a overload of information. I mean, it was 
time there and I, I mean, I, I've been working on the issue for so long, but there were some people on our delegation. This was like very brand new issue for them. And I can't even imagine what they're processing right now. Of It's so much information that I think after the trip, I almost like shut down. Like I couldn't intake a lot of new information. Like before I went, I you know was following the news every single day of what was happening in Gaza. And after I've gotten back, I'm like, I can't, I can't have this like information overload anymore. So I mean, it was two weeks of 14 hour days. I mean, we were going everywhere. I mean, this, this was only a small snapshot of um, where we went and what we did. Um, but it really did change me as a person. Um, and I think, I think everyone should go who works on this issue um, just to, I think, ground your advocacy and like meet some of these people that are dealing with this on a daily basis and what their daily lives look like. Um, and I know I'm working on another trip to bring United Methodist bishops to the Holy Land because, I mean, I know this is being recorded, but just talking about my own position, like it's our council of bishops that is sometimes in the way of um, fulfilling our policy on ending the occupation. They, like my agency is really good. We have a really great policy on ending the occupation, but it's always the bishops that are, uh, kind of standing in the way. So I'm like, you need to come and see, and you need to have a tour, you need to see for yourselves, and I hope that strengthens our advocacy on it. Hope that answers that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just to follow up, uh, we, uh, my, council, my city councilwoman went to Israel after October 7th, but she didn't go to the West Bank. Yeah. Have, have there been any um, congressional trips that you know of to the West Bank? Yeah, not that any I know. I don't know if Emily or anybody else knows of it. I, I, I don't know of anything. Oh, J Street delegation, okay. Has that been recently, after October? No, it's before. Yeah, it was a while ago, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot recently. There's, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, so many of them are going on APAC trips to Israel and only getting one side of the situation. Yeah. Yeah. In the resolution that come out from the city, that impact on the people, uh, for example, we were calling for ceasefire and, and, uh, and peace, and we went to visit our uh, city fathers and the mayor, and uh, they had it on their, on their agenda. They still haven't done anything bad. And do you think that? I mean, I think multiple other people can also speak to this. Um, I, I believe so. I mean, there's not always like a direct impact. I mean, you don't necessarily see a city pass a resolution, then immediate change on a larger federal level. But I think one, I mean, it's really an educational opportunity for people in that city to be learning more. And I also think it, it does aid in like the federal legislators in that area. If they see that their city has voted for a ceasefire resolution, I mean, that really puts pressure on them of like, my constituents support this. If I wanna be reelected, I might wanna call for a ceasefire. But I don't know if Emily or anybody wants to comment on that too. Yeah, they know everything. They are so thankful for any kind of advocacy that we're doing here in the US. And I mean, they're following it so closely and they're, they're really thankful for any advocacy that's happening. But the biggest thing they said is you need to do more. You need to go back and you need to do more, especially the Christian organizations and the churches we were meeting with. They're like, where are the US churches? What are you doing? You're not doing enough. So yes, they, yeah, they're fully aware. And I think we need to keep going and, and do more, yeah. Yeah. And this seems to uh, affect you being like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm against the uh, Jewish mm -hmm. their whole concept when we speak out against it. And if you're not, you're just asking to understand and to, yeah. to have a more humanitarian view and to be mm -hmm. peaceful rather than to be militaristic and to be uh, warlike. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think some of the most amazing activists we've worked with have been Jewish. Like, I mean, how, how can that be anti-Semitic when that's such a large part of who is doing this advocacy? So, I mean, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, just a couple of things. Um, one is that um, I, 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 I don't think I saw in your list that We need to stop funding Israel, military funding in particular. Yeah. We need to stop. Um, and um, I, I just, I think that's so important um, because we, yeah. we are enabling um, Gaza. Mm -hmm. We are paying for it. Yeah. Um, and the West Bank. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a side of the pond. I think there has to be to there has to be um, engagement. Um, just as Jews have engaged, just as Jews have been engaged with other Jews, I think Christians need to engage with other Christians, and Unitarian Universalists need to engage with everybody. <laughs> yeah. But. Um, I don't mean to be casting, you know, telling people what to do, but it just seems to me that that's a, an engagement that I have not seen much um, emphasis on. Yeah, I mean, some of those conversations are being had, but I, I agree. I th it needs to happen on a much larger scale of unpacking that Christian Zionism and how it's so dominant, and especially some of the evangelical churches. And I will say, like, I'm on the board of Churches for Middle East Peace, and we do have representation for, from some evangelical traditions. And so we know there are people out there that they do have this theological grounding of a just peace in Israel and Palestine and human rights and social justice across many different issues. But I, I think we need to have more of those conversations with people that have been brought up in those traditions and maybe they're you know, for social justice on other issues, but they've like just been sucked in so much into this like Zionist thinking. Um, I think we need to talk to them more. I completely agree. Um, I think some of them, I will say, are too far gone. I mean, some of these that have these like end times theology and it's such a violent ideology that at its core is displacing people from their homeland. Like, where do you start on that of like dialogue? But I, I do generally agree. I think especially talking with those that have a evangelical tradition, I think we always assume that there are these, you know, further right um, folks that have this ideology, but that's not always true. So I agree on that. Um, and I think that's something that we are working through. Um, there's this big action happening in DC to counter the Christians United for Israel. I know you mentioned at the beginning um, that, I mean, this is this is a group founded by John Hagee and it's very based in this like end times theology. And I mean, just such a violent, horrible group. And there's so there's a big interfaith action that's going to be countering that. And I hope that's kind of a start of some more of these actions to counter that. Um, 
Yeah, so I completely agree. I think we need to unpack that more. Um, and just what we were talking about at the beginning of, uh, yeah, I didn't mention of advocacy of cutting off arms to Israel, and it's so important. I mean, we sometimes leave out of the conversation of what the IDF is doing in the West Bank. It's, yes, it absolutely is about Gaza and cutting off arms of what they're doing there, but also all of this displacement, all of the settler violence, I mean, that's, that's U.S. taxpayer money. Um, actually, we went to um, this jewelry store, this like handcraft jewelry store, and they made jewelry out of empty gas canisters and all of them said made in Pennsylvania <laughs> and so we're like all right we'll give you your we'll give you our money like please take our money for the jewelry like we just feel so guilty about that um, so you can you can see it's so poignant and in, uh, in the West Bank so yeah completely agree on all the points Absolutely seen that um, generational divide and I think like even conversations like you were talking about of anti-semitism I mean it's so real in so many different movements and we need to talk about it and we're not talking about it enough and it's youth groups it's young people that I'm actually seeing like especially on the college campuses like I mean I saw at GW in DC like they were having teach-ins on anti-semitism and the role of that in this movement and it, yeah it's young people that are yeah unpacking these conversations and really leading on this so I'll just say yes, I, I have seen that. Um, I also just wanted to point out as I'm talking about this Christian Zionism, I mean, that is anti-Semitic at its core. Like Christian Zionism, Zionism in and of itself is anti-Semitic. I mean, especially this like end times theology is like, yeah, the Jewish people will be converted to Christians and it's, it's wild. I mean, I think we need, to, we need to talk more about that of how that's anti-Semitic and but just the a broader role of anti-Semitism and how that we need to combat that. I mean, if we're for human rights and social justice, that absolutely needs to be addressed. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Either. Yeah.
not like the Palestinian Authority. I mean, they acknowledge the role of the PAs and um, other Palestinian leadership and where they're at right now. And I mean, especially like a lot of the Christian groups we met with that have this um, basis is in, basis in nonviolent resistance were also, you know, condemning Hamas um, as well. And so we, we really heard a lot of um, antipathy towards their leadership um, and yeah, just acknowledging their role and yeah, um, nothing good that we really heard um, yeah, throughout the West Bank. Not, not everyone, we didn't talk solely about that, so I didn't hear from everyone uh, that we met with on their views on that, but that's generally the sentiment I heard, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Who benefits from this, this condition? Why, what, uh, what are, in terms of the American policy, because that's what's driving the whole thing, and no matter where you go, it's the American policy that's driving this whole thing. Um, uh, China, the, uh, right now, Iran is on the, uh, it, uh, Cuba, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's anything that's against the American policy. So my question is, how do you, one, how do you change human nature? You know, uh, what strategies can be used for, for uh, changing our foreign policy? How do we, you know, the money is what drives this whole business. Somebody always makes money on, on wars. Somebody's making money on this whole business. So we have to, and the people who are making the money are very, uh, very well hidden. They could be your next door neighbor, you know, depending on what neighborhood you live in, if you can afford the taxes there. Um, but, you know, we, it keeps coming down to the same thing. If we don't change the foreign policy of this nation, if we have no way of influencing the politicians that uh, keep and maintain this sort of thing, this is doomed to go on forever. Now, most Americans, of, even the poor ones, uh, are fat, dumb, and happy. Uh, they're sitting here, they've got food every night, they've got a place to sleep, and uh, if no bombs are falling on their head, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> your children, their children aren't being hacked up into little bits and all this kind of thing. You know, it's just the horrific goings on always benefits somebody, not just here, but in Africa, Asia, you know, wherever you go, it's the same stuff. So again, I keep coming back to the same question. Who benefits? How do we reach those people? How do we cut off their benefits? How do we make them feel some pain? Because that's what really changes things is if you could, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you answered your question. Um, no, but I mean, that's the biggest thing that I took away from the trip is that importance of the financial aspect of who benefits from that and how do we make it not convenient for them um, anymore to be doing this. And again, like I, I was kind of going back to this like insistence always on like, you know, you need to talk to your enemies, you need to have dialogue. And yes, we absolutely do. But after seeing some of the situations there, I'm like, how can you? I mean, how can we expect people under occupation to be friends, make friends, have dialogue with their oppressor. And we need to do more. We need to hit them where it hurts. We need to hit the Israeli settlements where it hurts. And that's, I mean, it's financial motivation, right? Um, I think I'm more, unfortunately, pessimistic than ever, unfortunately. I, like, after seeing these massive settlements, I mean, again, I think that narrative has been like, oh, these are just like hilltop small communities. And like, how do you, how do you go forward on that when there's these massive, massive cities that dot the West Bank and Jerusalem? I mean, how we're talking about making this into a, making Jerusalem a capital, making West Bank part of this Palestinian state, and you can't 
do that when it's so fragmented, but how do you begin to talk about dismantling those settlements when they're one, so massive, and two, I mean, the settlers that are there, they're not leaving. I mean, even if the Israeli government tomorrow has an order of like, you're all gonna vacate the settlements, which first of all, it's not gonna happen, but it's not like they wouldn't follow that. They are there because it's this divine right to this land that they have and this ideology. Um, so I, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's one, it's our own government and it's, it's the financial aspect of it. I mean, that's the biggest thing I took away is that's the most important thing we can do. We should absolutely do this advocacy, but I mean, I know I was talking to some earlier, but it, it's just so depressing to see such a little movement in the last nine months. And we've, we've been working so hard on this advocacy and of course we need to continue, but I think it's the financial aspect of it. It's where's the money going and who is benefiting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, been, it's been my observation that, um, um, that before Biden's terrible debate and then before Ray, Ray, what's his name? the other guy, that shot. Um, um, sorry, I go back away. Anyway, um, 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 that Gaza was much more in the in the news, and much more in, in our presence, and much more in our lives. And um, I think it's fallen off the radar, and I think it's fallen off in importance. And I think. Um, we need to get it back, back up there because, um, because, because Gaza is happening every day and it's getting worse again. And um, as if it wasn't getting bad every day, um, and um, and the West Bank is worse than it's been ever been. So, um, you know, uh, hundreds of people in the West Bank are getting shot. So. Um, I just, I, I think we need to get it back into the news cycle too. Um, and I mean, Israel was being very helpful with that because they were bombing every day, but we we have to get it back into the news cycle. Yeah, I mean, the narrative is Joe Biden won't win because of his debate performance or his age, and maybe he's won't win because he's committing genocide in Palestine. You know, like that's not the narrative that we're hearing, right? It's only in the last few weeks, yeah. yeah Mm -hmm. I think that um, um, I think it's easy. I, I, I think that's one debate, and that's a really important debate. But another debate is that we have to talk about yeah. Gaza, and we have to talk about the West Bank, and we have to talk about um, the fact that we that we are enabling it. Um, yeah. What if the Congress had backbone and said? We are not going to have the time you were here and turn their back on them. What would that happen? What would, what kind of impact would that be? Would do you think it would have any influence? Yeah, it would have a big impact, just unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> not happening. I mean, we'll see on Wednesday what happens with Netanyahu's visit, and I know a lot of congressional offices are weighing what exactly they want to do with Netanyahu's visit. I know a lot of them will be boycotting, but some of them are weighing, like, do we walk out? Do we just not go? Do we hold counter events? But yeah, I mean, it would have a big impact if more were to do that, but we're just not. Well, I mean, that's a big part of it is they're not going to challenge Netanyahu when they're getting that APAC money. Yeah. What, what are your last few words? We're not going to what? Oh, we're, I mean, congressional offices aren't going to reject Netanyahu if they're getting APAC money. I mean, they're literally being paid by the Israeli lobby. Were you going to comment on something with that too? Or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the subject of Netanyahu. You're right that congressional offices aren't going to, there are many of them are scared to, to speak out against him, but lots of Israelis themselves are, are not. And, mm -hmm. and um, but, you know, there were mass, even before Gaza, there were massive protests against.
against him um, for, for trying to you know, just uh, take away power from the courts, and now all the families, the host, many of the families, the hostages are protesting. So I, I just, I always try to, I always find it helpful to try and distance Netanyahu and settler policies from Israel, generally, or for some, or certain Israelis. But I'm just wondering, if, you know, in, in your experiences, like how much does that, does that happen in, in, in the conversations you've had with the yeah. West Bank or, or, or Israel? Like how much distance do people put between the yeah. Israelis, you know, society, and Yeah, I mean, a lot of things we're hearing in the West Bank is, you know, we of course need to get rid of Netanyahu, but that's not going to address the root problem, right? Um, I mean, if we get rid of Netanyahu, which he should absolutely go, I mean, successors could be worse. <laughs> successors, or they could be the same, or even if they're slightly more moderate, probably not going to be anti-occupation, probably not going to actively take steps to end the occupation. So that's generally the narrative we were hearing in the West Bank. Like, yeah, we absolutely need to talk about Netanyahu, but we need a larger conversation than that. And a lot of conversations I've had coming back here, that's what it always reverts to. Like, yeah, Netanyahu, like it always comes back to him of, yeah, we need to get him out and then we'll have a ceasefire of, yeah, that may be the case, but it doesn't solve the underlying issue. So I agree. I think it needs to be a larger conversation and needs to not just be about Netanyahu. I mean, I yeah, absolutely need to talk about him addressing US Congress, but it's it's much larger than that. Yeah. I a question I just still come, keep coming back to we have to have something uh, concrete that we do. Uh, something that changes the foreign policy that we have what our goals are from a country, uh, from a countrywide perspective. What are our goals and aspirations? And identify what the problems are and how do we address those in a way that uh, every, everyone can climb on board. Uh, I don't have that much faith in human nature. I don't really expect anything like that to happen that requires people actually thinking about things and weighing and evaluating it and saying, well, you know, it's a really bad idea what we can do. Uh, we really need to do something different. Well, that's not going to happen. Okay. So, again, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a, something that we can do to actually stop the, yes, that's okay. To actually, I'm sorry about the, um, the, uh, I'm looking for something that we can do that makes an impact, something that actually does something more than we chat about it over and over again with the like-minded people. How do we change the hearts and minds of the people who can make a difference? And uh, again, it always comes down to cutting into the money. You gotta figure out a way of uh, making them feel some pain. So how do we do that? Can we focus on uh, that instead of being diverted by our media, our media is not helping us. Uh, they decided that Net, I mean, uh, that uh, 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 what's his name? The, no, the president, the old guy. He and I share the same page, so uh, you know, and, and, uh, how do we? Uh, how do we uh, 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 you know, every politician that I know uh, or, or I have seen in the years that I've been here um, puts on his yarmulke to dash his office. As soon as he's elected, he or she is elected, including my councilwoman, uh, put on her yarmulke and off to Israel. She went to pay fealty to uh, Israel. What's it, what, what does Israel have on us? Why do we owe? Is Israel one of our states? Is it part of this government? What's going on? <laughs> These are real questions I have about how things are done. What do we do to break up that little, that, that terrible little cabal there and, and get rid of this thing? Self-questionary. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one thing that 
I was really thinking about on the trip is where are the Israelis? Like where, who are they that like, are they working on this? Who is in Israel that's working on it? And how do we get Israeli society to come around? And as you mentioned with the big Netanyahu protests, like that's absolutely a start. Um, but again, it does not address the root causes. And we met with so many really progressive Israeli organizations, but it's not enough. I mean, I think the voices of Israeli Jews especially are so important. And I mean, I think you mentioned like just the fear of being called anti-Semitic. I do think that's a big thing that dominates our political culture is they might not feel that they know enough to speak out in Palestine. They're so terrified of being called anti-Semitic. And I know at our um, United Methodist Church General Conference, our big legislative conference, we have we had a kind of a slate of horrible resolutions that were introduced. And one of them was on um, the definition of anti-Semitism. It's a IHRA, yeah, definition of adopting that, which explicitly says any criticism of Israel would be labeled as anti-Semitism. So we were really worried about this getting through, um, but we had a woman from Israel come and speak. She's Israeli Jewish, and so many members on that committee that were voting on this were like, oh, that made me realize, like she was like, I'm Israeli, I'm Jewish, and I speak out against this definition of anti-Semitism. I mean, their voices are so, so important and people pay attention. So uh, even at the Interfaith March for Human Rights I was talking about, I mean, it was really great to see rabbis and so many others speaking out. I'm like, we need more of this. Why, why aren't there thousands and thousands of people here? Like, I think it's Israeli society. I mean, I think, there are perhaps people doing that good work, but we but we need more of them. And I don't know if that answers the ultimate question of how do we change U.S. foreign policy. I mean, I think there's so many aspects that we've been talking about today. I think the financial aspect is so important. But yeah. Yes. I'd love to see that list. I think that would be. resources list too. Yeah. 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 Great. Great. And can we, will we be able to possibly get a recording of this? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm happy to include a link to the slideshow as well. And thank you to Joe for recording this as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so I think we can send those links in the follow-up, yeah. On Sundays at Union Square, at 4 or 5 o'clock, uh, Israeli-Americans demonstrate every Sunday mm. in favor of a ceasefire and all that. Great. That's great. Yeah. Do you want to say something as well? Yeah, I was just, I mean, this is a whole, whole New area, but it, it, um, where this world goes, either it's going to be totally ethnically cleansed or there's going to be a few people surviving, and the hatred that has been generated, um, that has been amplified. I mean, it's always been there, but it's it's been hugely amplified, and um, how how 
the world deals with that, how we deal with it. I mean, again, we're the enablers, so we're, um, we're responsible for, to, to deal with that. But um, how that happens is something that we all need to focus on as well. Um, all this time we've been focused on gossip and before hearing you I was thinking that what's going on in the West Bank is, was a much smaller amount of settlers and that's what I'm uh, that people don't know about this, you know, everything has been about Gaza, which is uh, so overwhelming, yeah. but this is, um, people just don't know about this, and I feel like talking about, um, not, you know, not paying for the weapons, uh, the, uh, our responsibility, my responsibility, for the weapons that are killing all these people in Gaza is such a big thing and, and every part of what everything on the campuses all over the United States we're doing is talking about the funding and um, that's uh, I just feel like that's a whole other thing but that we need to draw attention to this place that we thought was kind of safe, like uh, there's some settlers, but not to this extent, not cities of people. Yeah. I mean, I imagine there was all this farmland and then there were some very aggressive settlers with, that were given guns and they were uh, invade, you know, threatening the farmers and getting them out. Not that there were <laughs> cities actual cities we just thought there was some place safe I mean I thought there was some place safe yeah and I didn't know to that extent either really speaking of what's happening uh, is just a culmination of 170 years of genocide. And that's how we need to be thinking about all of the occupied Palestinian territories. It's a genocidal project. And Gaza is the culmination of decades of that. And the West Bank could become the next, yeah. becoming the next Gaza. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One thing referencing what, what David mentioned before is uh, what U.S. foreign policy is, and particularly in congressional elections, where it's famous that they don't want to talk about foreign policy. And I was in a very contentious district where the election was very contentious two years ago. Where is that? Uh, in Brooklyn, District 10. Mm -hmm. um, and there were three progressives and Dan Goldman. Dan Goldman won the primary, the Democratic primary, with 24% of the vote because the other three progressive candidates split the vote. Um, and in response, and he was actually in Israel on October 7th and had to hide with his family. He has five children, I believe. Um, but what has sprung out of that is a group called um, New York 10 Neighbors. Um, that demonstrates outside of his district office every single week and is going to start too late for this year, but is really organizing around how can he be defeated in the primary two years from now. And I think that that is something that at least as New Yorkers, um, we should think of doing in almost every district. There are some districts that would be a waste of time, but um, certainly I think New York 10, he's not representative of what the population is like. And there's, there are uh, districts in Manhattan that are similar, where they really, this pro-Israeli stance does not represent their constituents. 
Hakeem Jeffries, the minority leader, also a Brooklyn Democrat. I saw a speech of his before APAC a few years ago where he said, well, in Brooklyn, we think of Israel as the sixth borough. I was like, what? <laughs> I never heard anybody ever say that, but that is the position of black man. This is the position that he's taking and that organizing in his district to talk about foreign policy, because he actually is great on domestic policy, has done a lot for his district, and that's what keeps him getting elected and rising to power. And then, and then the, the right-wing foreign policy that he endorses also helps him. And so, I mean, that's a, that's a big district, and he's very powerful now, so it's very, it'd be very hard to challenge him. But in the other districts, and of course we have the terrible example of Bowman, Jamal Bowman, who went down in place. But that just tells us what we have what we have to do. Yeah, yeah I don't know if others were organizing in New York. Yeah, I mean I think the reality is we need such a diversity of tactics. We need we need all of this. I mean, we need that electoral organizing that might not be everyone's calling, but it, it's, we need that needs to happen. We need, we need all hands on deck. We need all sorts of different tactics and actions to make change. Yeah. But because of this fear of being told, called anti-Semitic, I know I felt gagged. So many people feel gagged. It's like a secret weapon. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's But I just feel not just that I'm gagged, but all these politicians are gagged. They cannot. They can, everybody's got to join this because of the because New York has such a high, a great Jewish population. I mean, more. What is it? More than any po yes, place in, beside Israel. Uh, beside Israel or, or in New York. We no, can't. It's also, it's also, let's just, just remember that not all Jews. So I'm so I'm accused of being anti-Semitic. I think I can. I think if I can respond at least to the extent that I'm satisfied as to whether I'm being anti-Semitic at a given moment or not. I, I hope that I'm not being anti-Semitic, but I I do I will maintain that criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic. Criticizing the actions of states is not. Am I being anti-Semitic if I am angry at people who are Jewish? Living that are my neighbors or whatever that, that support what's going on in Israel. 
if I'm angry, it, it, yeah, I mean. I think you're, I'm sorry, I think you're allowed to be angry. I think, yeah. but I think the way we have, we have to remember the that they're pro-Israeli. Yeah, that, that, yeah. And if I, Israel. it's like people who are behind um, I feel very, my people in my family, old friends, I'm I can't speak to them. I, I can't. I can't communicate with them. I'm very angry at them because they support this. So I, I mean, it's. It's not the only one. Oh, oh, no, it's like, but it's. But I do think the conversation. I mean, you know, it's the hard conversations yeah. that are the ones that are worth having, right? It's the hard conversations that are worth having, and and um, we need to figure out how to have those conversations in a humane and non-accusatorial way and yet. When you talked about the demolition, I sent money to the organization 10 or 15 years ago, and the demolition, Carol Houston introduced us. And I knew before I had met Carol Houston and sent money for the demolition. The Janine Freedom Theater, 
I've sent money to them for the last 20 years. And when you think about it, the man who was the head of it, he was kept, the Janine Freedom Theater brings young people, young Israelis and young, and young Palestinians together to discuss and to talk about their lives, to talk about the, the similarities and the, and the, and the dissimilarities in sense, so they understand one another. I have been supporting them for a long time. And this is, this is an issue. And I'm not anti-Semitic, but I understand. But it's just like the racism that we develop is apartheid in Israel, just as we have it in this country. Mm -hmm. And when we're perpetuating it, when we send the money to Israel, it's the same thing as perpetuating apartheid. Mm -hmm. That money, and when you say to the Congress, when the Congress can't get money for, I say all the time, Sally knows, and, and, and Tara, that you can't get for health care, and you heard me today, and housing, and education, and for infrastructure, and for transportation. They can't find money, but Americans can find billions of dollars to kill people. I don't understand that mentality. How do we change that mentality? But all that machine, what do they say in the UN? The three biggest industries, munitions, sex trafficking, and drugs. And that's the, those are the big industries that make money. And the lobbyists who make money, the pharmaceutical industry, thousands of dollars. And they keep, they keep us on these drugs that really don't help us, in a sense, but they feed their pocketbook. And like David says, when you pinch their pocketbook, that's how you make a difference in them. As Eileen said, send the list out, get the list out. And, and boycott, you're not supposed to boycott, but friendly ways of doing it and getting out to people. And when you go to the stores, look at them, the Koch brothers. We had the list of the Koch brothers, didn't we? And we stopped buying toilet paper and all kinds of things that they, well, they produced or had something to do with. It's money, 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 money all the time. And that's all we look at is that green dollar. I mean, I think these conversations can definitely continue, and I know that all of you are doing so much work for a ceasefire and for a just peace. And yeah, thank you so much for having me, and I hope that. Yeah, providing some of the things uh, happening on the ground in the West Bank and Jerusalem is helpful in that advocacy. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah.